great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. justice God you use the weak to lead the strong you lead us in the song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember to see perfection bore our penalty with the grace so glorious immortal praises without end all hailing the king of righteousness as law gave way to liberty and freedom for humanity with the grace so glorious and all the glory of the Savior's love Surrounding our surrender to know forever we are welcomed home. Crowned in glory to glory, worthy is the Lord of all the glory. 
glory forever. Holy is the Lord, crowning glory to glory. Worthy is the Lord of all the glory forever. Holy is the Lord. Triumphant praise is without end. All hailing the King of Righteousness And every eye beholds the one Our hearts were undeserving of With the grace so glorious And oh, the glory of the same Surrounding us, surrender to know Forever we are welcomed home Crowning glory to glory Worthy is the Lord of all the glory forever Holy is the Lord, crowning glory to glory. Holy is the Lord of all the glory forever. Holy is the Lord. of him who ransomed me I'll fall and worship at his feet and rise to reign eternally in a grace so glorious home oh, in a grace so glorious Crowning glory to glory, worthy is the Lord of all the glory forever. Holy is the Lord, crowning glory to glory, worthy is the Lord of all the glory forever. Holy. Crowning glory to glory, worthy is the Lord of all.
decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. turning back the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, still I will follow, though none go with me, still I will follow, though Still I will follow No turning back No turning back Because there is no one higher No one greater No one like our God there is none more evil. Christ our Savior, great and glorious. There is no one higher, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able. Christ our Savior, great and glorious. There is no one higher, no our Savior, great and glorious. There is no one higher, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able. Christ our Savior, great and glorious. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence. Astounded by your mercy and love Our hands are lifted high in surrender Your grace for me is always enough There is no one higher than our God there is no one greater than you. Let my life forever praise the glory of your name. There is no one higher than you. No, there is no one higher than you. center of it all Jesus at the center of it all from beginning to the end it will always be a 
It's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center, and everything revolves around you, Jesus, you, the center of it all, the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing even matters. Nothing in this world will do, yeah. You're the center, and everything revolves around you, Jesus. You from my heart to the heavens, Jesus, be the center, it's all about you. Yes, it's all about you From my heart to the heavens Jesus, be the center It's all about you Yes, it's all about you From my heart to the heavens Jesus be the center, it's all about you, yes it's all about you, from my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center, it's all about you, yes it's all about you. Jesus be the center of your church Jesus be the center of your church And every knee will bow And every tongue shall confess you Jesus Jesus, 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 the center of it all. The center of it all. God, yes, we do thank you for being the center of it all. 
God, would you be the center of our joy? God, reminding us that all that is good and perfect comes from you. God, we acknowledge that there is no one higher than you. No one higher than you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, we lift your name high. Amen. Well, good morning, Hope Church, Boulder City. I hope you and your families are all doing well. I have a word for you. Interruptions. We all have them. At work, at home, on the road, at school, in the middle of a phone call, we all have them. And sometimes we respond in disbelief, and sometimes we're instantly thrust into a state of panic. Other times we're frustrated or disappointed, but we're virtually always surprised by them. Interruptions come in a lot of different forms, like a relationship turned sour, a decision not bringing about the results you expected, losing a job, bad news from a doctor, a phone call or text you never expected. I find myself responding to interruptions with thoughts like, I didn't see this coming, or that wasn't the plan, or I didn't sign up for this, and I'm thinking you can all relate. But in those times of disbelief, panic, or frustration, have you ever considered how God views the interruptions in our lives? Today as a church, we're gonna, we'll be starting a two-part series appropriately entitled God's Perspectives on Life's Interruptions. And as you can see, our passage will be coming from Matthew chapter 8. We'll be looking at several verses from that chapter. Well... Back to God's perspectives on our interruptions. First of all, I want to tell you, there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news is that life is filled with interruptions. The good news is that interruptions do not alter God's plan. And so in an attempt to gain a proper perspective on life's interruptions, we're going to look at how Jesus responded when his life was interrupted. And we'll get those snapshots of Jesus' life from Matthew at chapter 8. The first verse of that chapter says this. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. That kind of sets the stage for the context. After preaching what is known as the greatest sermon in history, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus comes down the mountain and is immediately surrounded by people. And in the next 33 verses in Matthew 8, we see example after example of Jesus' life being interrupted. I think what we'll find is that Jesus responded to interruptions quite differently than how we usually respond. Because during Jesus' public ministry, he consistently embraced interruptions as the Father's invitation to join his activity. So, to help us gain a right perspective on life's interruptions, I want to ask and answer three simple questions. First, What are interruptions? Well, here's a very simple, workable definition for you. Interruptions are unexpected disruptions in what was previously planned. And we all have plans. Some are very specific, some are general. We plan for daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, or they may even span many years or even decades. And we all experience disruptions that change those plans. We know what that looks like. I mean, look around. Most of us are in the middle of the longest interruption of our lives. And if you're someone who likes to plan, interruptions can feel like unexpected problems, unwanted complications, pointless distractions from what's really important, your plans. But get this. The big idea here today is that what we see as interruptions from something may be God inviting us to something. Uninvited interruptions in our lives may actually be God redirecting our plans to align with his. Second question is, 
what do interruptions look like? Well, as I said earlier, interruptions take on a lot of different forms, and I'm going to give you three categories that a lot of life's interruptions will fit into. First of all, interruptions can be physical. Uh, these are interruptions in the form of opportunities for us to meet a need in the life of someone else. And in fact, four times in Matthew 8, Jesus is approached by an individual or group with a need that is physical, and they ask him to meet that need. The first interruption of Matthew 8 is Jesus being approached by a man with leprosy, asking to be cleansed. Jesus saw the opportunity God was giving him to help someone with a physical need and redirected himself and healed the man. Well, the next event we see is Jesus entering a city and a Roman centurion came to him and begged him for help, saying this. He said, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Now, notice he didn't say, I'll pray for him. He, Jesus had just walked into Capernaum. He was undoubtedly tired, probably hot, probably hungry, probably thirsty. He had been on the road. And instead of saying, let me go get a bite to eat, and I'll swing by your place a little later, he said, I'll come and heal him. And when he said that, the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. And you drop down to verse 13 and you see the end response that Jesus had and the results. Verse 13 says this, And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. Those two examples and even two more times in this chapter alone, we see Jesus redirecting so he could meet the physical needs of others. So one of the ways interruptions will come in the form of opportunity is in the form of opportunities to meet physical needs of others. The second is that interruptions can be providential. Now, listen closely here. These are events when God gives us the opportunity to trust him based on what we know about him. Do you remember when Jesus, of course you do, do you remember when Jesus was in a boat with the disciples? And, and since they were with Jesus, the disciples probably all expected smooth sailing, but God providentially put a storm in their path that threatened to swamp the boat. And the apostles, as you know, Jesus was sleeping and they came to him and woke him and said, save us, Lord, we're perishing and when opportunities to trust God come my way, I usually find myself doing the exact same thing. Reacting based on my circumstances rather than what I know to be true about God. He had just told them, we're going to the other side. And they forgot all about that when the storm came up. We've all been there. We've all had unexpected things happen when we've had our spiritual wits about us and, and we've responded in faith. You know, there are those times, those mountaintop experiences where we do so. But unfortunately, we've also had unexpected things happen when we did not have our spiritual wits about us and we responded in fear, anger, or disbelief. Well, thirdly, interruptions can be spiritual. These interruptions are a result of the spiritual battle we're all engaged in. You remember John 10.10. 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And then Jesus, on the other hand, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Because in the spiritual battle, the, the lines have been drawn. We do have a real enemy that hates us, and he relentlessly attacks us to destroy and discourage. And because that battle is real, some of the interruptions we experience will have a very spiritual nature to them. We see Jesus facing just such a spiritual interruption toward the end of chapter 8 when he does get to the other side. If you read verses 28 through 30, they'll say this. When he came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed, you don't get much more spiritual, spiritually oriented in battle than this. 
two men who were demon-possessed. They met him as they were coming out of the tombs. And they were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And they cried out, saying, and these are the men, crying out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time? Now notice I said this was the two men. That's what we see in that passage. We see two men saying to the Son of God, What business do we have with one another? What we see is the demons, but Jesus really saw the men. They were the victims here. They were the demon-possessed. They were the ones who needed help desperately. Verses 30 through 32 say this, Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from him. The demons began to entreat him. Now the voices are properly identified for us all. The demons began to entreat him, saying, If you're going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, One word, go. In the realm of spiritual battle, Jesus has dominating authority. And instantly, the verse says, They came out and went into the swine, and the whole herd rushed down into the steep bank, into the sea, and perished in the waters. Jesus spoke into this spiritual battle with the authority of God himself because that's who he is. But we also, from this, learn that the interruptions we face can not only be sometimes physical and sometimes providential, but also spiritual in nature. Now keep in mind, this is not an exhaustive list. It's simply a glimpse from Jesus' life that serves as an example of what we'll face in our lives. So first of all, we defined what interruptions are. Secondly, we identified what interruptions can look like. And now thirdly, in what ways does God accomplish his mission during our interruptions? This is huge and this is key. The interruptions we face have a purpose. So the question again, in what ways does God accomplish his mission during our temptations? You know, while disruption, disruptions usually shock us, they do not phase the Lord. He keeps moving forward. God can and will work through life's interruptions to accomplish his mission. And does that not give the interruptions that we face in our lives? a greater purpose than we perhaps ever recognized. He works through crises, natural disasters, and even pandemics to make himself known. And two ways God achieves his mission through our interruptions is one, God works through interruptions to change lives. And you've probably heard me say it many times, because I have, this is awesome to me. The, the thought that God would use us to change in positive ways the lives of others. Because God can work through what you're going through to change the lives of others. And again, that's extraordinarily encouraging to me. God can work through what you're going through to change the lives of others. This gives immeasurable value to our struggle. Because every human being on the planet comes into this world missing the most precious ingredient of life. A loving relationship with the God who made them. We were made to love God and be loved by Him. At the deepest possible level, we're designed for that relationship. Birds are made to fly, so they do. Fish are made to swim, so they do. It's their nature. But the component of life which is the single most important for human beings is missing. We forfeited that treasure by our own actions. We were born with a sin nature we inherited from our ancestors, yes. But we also voluntarily chose to sin against the true and living God. And because of that, we, we are separated from Him. And the most important event in any person's life 
is to be reconciled unto God so that relationship can be restored. This is true for every person Jesus encountered in Matthew chapter 8. And it's true of every person on the planet today. And the heartfelt desire of God is for people to be restored unto himself and to see their lives transformed for eternity. And get this, God wants to use us to restore that treasure to others. The incredible thing is that God can even work through our imperfections and during our interruptions and make that a reality for them. At any given time, whether we find ourselves on a mountaintop and things are going well or in a valley, we must live with the sensitivity to what God's doing around us. Just because things aren't going as you plan doesn't mean things aren't, that, that God isn't actively using you. God actively and mightily used the interruptions of Jesus' life in Matthew 8. And he'll do the same with us if we'll let him. If you and I can walk through this imperfect life willing to be redirected from our plan to God's plan, he will use us to bring restoration to hurting people. And I want to give you three examples of God using his people in the middle of interruptions. Uh, one just happened to Nell and I just recently. Last Sunday afternoon, Nell and I wanted to ride out to Benelli Bay and just check it out. We, it's, a, it's a long, dirty, dusty trail that's extraordinarily rough. But we wanted to get out there and just kind of get by ourselves together. And as we were driving down that dusty, sandy trail, we came upon a truckload of people who were stuck. They had gotten to a point where they were turning around to head home. They were giving up. They didn't like what they were seeing. It was two ladies, a guy, and three children. Well, we stopped. We helped them get unstuck. And about an hour later, after they were back, face, back on the road, facing the right direction finally, I had the opportunity to tell them that I had just preached a sermon entitled, Love Your Neighbor. And I had the opportunity to tell them that the word neighbor, and remember this is a, the, the, the sermon from last week, I had the opportunity to tell them that the word neighbor means those that you come in contact with, that enter into, as we said last week, your neighbor bubble. Anyone close enough that you happen to meet and we had the opportunity to tell them that that's why we stopped. We were just loving them because we were God's people. Well, the second example of God using his people in the middle of interruptions is some of you. Some of you have taken it upon yourself to be your brother's keepers by loving the members of our church family, by making sure they have what they need through this lockdown. And the third example of God using his people in the middle of an interruption is more of you. Others of you, one way or another, have been made aware of people in your neighborhood who have no affiliation with hope and who are struggling financially from layoffs and cutbacks. And several of you have, because I, I, through the videos that we've been posting, have invited you to let us know about your neighbors who need, need help. And in every instance, we've been able to come alongside them and help them. And they have been, quite honestly, the feedback I've been getting has been, quite honestly, shocking. People, again, who have no affiliation with hope, their lives, in one way or another, have been changed by God's people allowing themselves to be redirected to make a difference in the lives of others around them. In every one of those examples, people have come into contact with God through his people. Because his people were willing to be de redirected. And even in the middle of this monumental interruption we call COVID-19, God is still working through us. In fact, I would even suggest that without this interruption we call COVID-19, none of those opportunities would have come about. We would not have been on Sunday afternoon going to the lake. Those of you who have become your brother's keepers and are ministering to our church family members would have no reason to do so. And those of you who have helped those in your neighborhood 
would have had no opportunity for it. That's why I love Charles Stanley quote. He said this, sometimes the openings God gives seem like obstructions to our plans. But they're not. It is imperative that we stay sensitive to what God's doing around us or we will blow right past opportunities for God to change the lives of others through us. And that's exactly what we see in every example of Matthew 8 from Jesus' life. Regardless of what was on the agenda, he placed the highest priority on people. And now we read that chapter, we look back and we see a leper cleansed, we see a servant healed, we see a woman made well. We see an entire crowd of people experiencing healing from numerous diseases. And we see two men whose lives had been hijacked by demons. We see them set free. That's a big deal. Just ask the people being helped. And just ask Jesus. And it all happened as a result of him being interrupted. Wow. That's how Jesus chose to respond. And in the middle of our interruptions, God can change lives around us if we respond likewise. Well, the second way God achieves his mission through life's interruptions is God works through interruptions to, get this, increase our faith. The account of Jesus calming the storm is one of the all-time favorites in the New Testament. And we're going to, we, we alluded to this earlier, but we're going to look at it a little closer now. In Matthew 8, verse 18, we read this. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. This is where the, the trip across the, the big lake started. And in verse 23 through 25, it says this. When he got into the boat, his, disciple followed, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. As we saw earlier, they were terrified. But keep in mind, except for calming the storm, which was about to happen, and delivering the two demon-possessed men, which was going to happen when they got to the other side, they had just seen all the other miracles of Matthew 8. And even though he had said, we're going to the other side, they thought they were sinking in the middle. Then in verse 26, he said to them, why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. Don't you know when he asked that question, why are you afraid, men, afraid, men of little faith? That everything they had just seen came to mind. Jesus was apparently exhausted here. Trying to get some rest between interruptions. And between interruptions, they interrupted him. And his response strengthened their faith. Here's their response after Jesus calmed the sea. The men were amazed. And said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? These men had deeper faith in Jesus after the interruption than before the interruption. Here's what that means for us. When I feel like an unexpected and unwelcome event is just another problem that I have to deal with, and I think things like, why me? Or I didn't sign up for this. Even in times like that, God can strengthen my faith. And you know, this, this may be a new way of pro processing interruptions for you. And rather than just trying to wait it out, you may be realizing that God wants to use you to accomplish His mission in this long, long interruption we're all living through. If that's you, I want to give you a simple way to discern for yourself what God may be doing in your heart and in your life and even through your life. 
the Greek philosopher Aristotle is the originator of what's called the, the elements of circumstance, which is where we get what is commonly referred to as the five W's, who, what, when, where, why. If you're in communications or business, you're probably familiar with the five W's as a way to help share information or solve problems. But I want us to think about the five W's as they relate to God's activity in our interruptions. Normally, when we face an unexpected situation, we major on two of those five questions, why and when. Here are the questions we normally ask. Why is this happening? And when will this be over? But notice the selfish perspective of both of those. And realize that the other three questions can be incredibly valuable for us to ask during an interruption. Here are the questions we should ask. It's the other three, what, who, and where. What does, does God want to teach me here? Who does God want to show me? And where does God want to lead me? And so here's my challenge for you this week. Carve out some time to be alone with God and ask these three questions in response to an interruption in your life. It might be the COVID-19 interruption we're all dealing with. In fact, for most of us, that will be the interruption that we, that will be the context in which we will ask those three questions. Or it could be different from you. But either way, remember this. What we see as interruptions from something may be God inviting us to something. Well, if you'd like to contact us about being reconciled unto God or about dealing with an interruption in your life, let me encourage you to go to our website. It's hopechurchbc.com. And up in the top right corner, you'll see a tab that says Contact Us. And I would, I would love to hear from you. And normally at this point of the service, we take up our offering. And obviously, Nell and I are the only ones in the church right now. So uh, we have three ways that you can, do, you can give to Hope Church Boulder City if you're interested in doing so. The first is that website, hopechurchbc.com. And again, up in the top right corner, there's a tab that says Give. Secondly, you can use a mobile device to text Hope Church LV to 77977. And with the app, you can use your mobile device to give. Uh, it's an extraordinarily easy app to use. As you're going through the process, I would encourage you to make sure that your desti the destination for your giving is Hope, uh, Hope Church Boulder City Tithes. Unless you want your tithes to go to the main campus, which is obviously your call. The third method that we have for giving is you can simply mail a check to Hope Church of Boulder City at 850 Avenue B, Boulder City, Nevada, 89005. Well, I do have one more question for you today. Could you use a smile? As some of you know, this is our new grandson. His name is Dawson. For some reason, that picture just kind of helps everything. I don't know why, but it does. Well, I want to leave you with that and this. I love you, I miss you, and we'll talk soon.